Welcome to module 46 of Point Set Topology Part 1. Last time we stated and proved Tikhonov's theorem. Of course, we assumed Alexander's subbase theorem. So, in order to complete the proof of Tikhonov's theorem, we should now prove Alexander's subbase theorem. We have already made some set theoretic preparation for that also last time. So let us start uh, with the proof of Alexander's subbase theorem, which I restate here that X be a topological space and S be a subspace of its topology. X is compact if and only if every cover of X by the family of F admits a finite subcover. The necessity of this condition for compactness is obvious because X is compact, every open cover has to admit a finite subcover. After all, members of S are open, so some subfamily of S covers means that it is an open cover. So that must have admitted finite support. That condition is necessary. The crux of the matter is that we have to prove a converse. So we expected that this proof will be sufficiently complicated. Okay, so you have to be ready for that. So fix a subbase S for X. Okay, and let us have the notation that B is the base generated by S, namely elements of B are those which are finite intersection of members of S. So in what follows, I shall use the word cover to mean a cover for X. Okay, so that... Uh, that much shortage of notation is all time. Words, okay. A little bit of small words. What we have is let us let us just recall what is the meaning of all whatever you are doing. Every cover U of open subsets, Mr. Contain is a tau means U is a subfamily of tau, means they are open subsets, admits a finite subcover. This is the compactness, right? The second statement is every cover F contained inside B. That means what? Only members of this particular B are allowed. This is a smaller family than tau after all. That admits a finite subcover. The third one is even shorter. Every cover F silen contained in the subbase admits a finite subcover. Obviously, A implies B implies C. Okay. We have also seen that B implies A. Okay. Now, what we want to prove is C implies B. So, this is the gist of Alexander's subbase theorem. So, indeed, what we shall do is C implies the contrapositive of B, namely. If F is a subfamily of B, which has no finite subcover, then it is not a cover. So, which is the same thing as if it is a cover, then it has a finite subcover. So, it is in this form I am going to prove C implies B. Okay. So, this is all uh, just to clarify the ground situation. Now, the plan of attack is as for fix a family contained inside B, which admits no finite subcover. Construct 
a subfamily, another one like this. Namely, these are all now families of families. Okay, theta is H contained inside B such that F is inside H. This F is one, one such uh, family, okay, which admits no finite subcover. Finally, we want to show that it is not a cover for X. Okay. So, F contained inside H and H has no finite subcover. Okay, so look at all those H which also have this property, no finite subcover, but they are larger than F. So, that is my family of subfamilies so of tau here. The First claim is that using John's lemma, we should show that under the set theoretic inclusion, the partial order set theta, this is containment. So it's a partial order, has at least one maximal element. From one arbitrary f, we want to have something which is maximal. Okay, with respect to this property that it has no finite subcover. Okay. We have to assume there is one f, then only this theta will be non empty, we, we are sure. Then we have the maximal element. For that, we have to apply John's lemma, which means we have to prove something there. Okay, this is a, it's a plan of that type. Second step will be take such a maximal element, h in theta. Now put this epsilon equal to H intersection H. That means those members of H which are in the subbase. Those members of H which are in the subbase. The subbase is fixed. Okay. So that is a smaller family than H, right? Okay, this does not admit any finite subcover because H does not admit any finite subcover. So, how can epsilon admit finite subcover? If this does not admit finite subcover, from the hypothesis in C, it follows that this subfamily epsilon is not a cover for X. Okay, so up till here we have arrived by using Zorn's lemma and our assumption that there is a f such that which is not does not tell me finite subcovers. Okay. Now, second claim is look at the union of all all members of this H, and so that is clearly. Uh, so, this is a claim, sorry. Look at all the members of H, that, that is not a cover. That is what uh, we, we know. It doesn't have admit finite subcovers. But now, take the entire set. We will show that this is contained inside unions of members of this epsilon. So, what we have concluded for epsilon, epsilon does not, does not cover X. So, this will also does not cover X. So that will complete the proof. If this union of all elements in H is contained in the union of all elements in this epsilon, and epsilon does not cover X, so H is also not a cover of X. If H is not a cover of X, remember H was having some maximal property. In, a, in particular, F is contained inside H. So if H does not cover, F also does not cover. Okay, so that will complete the proof. So we have to prove two steps here. In the first claim, we have to prove the Zorn's lemma, whatever hypothesis is needed. That is the first part. And then you have to prove this claim. Okay, once we prove this claim, claim two is over, once so that the proof will be completed. So it remains to prove claim 1 and claim 2. So let us do it one by one. Look at claim 1. Let us let me just recall. 
Okay, this theta has a maximal element, is what you have to show. For that, what is the ingredient that you have to put inside the Sohn's lemma? Take any chain inside theta, we must show that that chain has an upper bound. This is what I would show. This part is very easy. As usual, quite often, let phi be a chain in theta. Recall what is the meaning of chain? Chain is a totally ordered subset of theta under the usual inclusion here. Okay. Consider the family G, which is the union of all members of this chain. Obviously, under the inclusion, that will be an upper bound for this one. But don't hurry, that must be an element of theta. Then only it will be justified. The larger uh, set of all subsets, it is an upper bound, fine. Okay, so clearly G contains F. Because each member of this uh, member of this chain, they are members of theta. All the members of theta contain F. Okay, so it is a subfamily of B also because each member of theta is also subfamily of B. So if you take unions of uh, all these members, you know you, you take each all 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 the members are inside B. So that is not a problem. Moreover, suppose finitely many members of G, say G1, G2, G1, cover X. This is the last part which I have show that it is inside theta. That no finite family covers X. That's what you have to show, right? If not, suppose there are G1, G2, G1 belonging to G, which cover X. Remember what was G? G is just the union of members of this chain. So G1 will be inside say some lambda 1, G2 will be lambda 2, G3 will be lambda 3 and so on. But these are all one contained in the other. You take the maximum of these. When you have finitely many of them, you have the maximum. That will contain all the G1, G2, Gn. Okay. But that is a member of this theta. So it won't cover. So it's a contradiction. Okay. So I repeat, all these Gi's are in one single element G prime of V. But this G prime is a family which belongs to theta. By definition, it has no finite subcover for X. So this is absurd because we assumed that G admits a finite subcover. So G does not admit a finite subcover that qualifies it to be a member of theta. Therefore, every chain in theta has an upper bound in theta. Once you have satisfied this property, John's lemma tells you that theta has a maximal element. Okay, so first claim is done. Okay. <clears throat> Second claim. Take an element which is a maximal element for theta. Any maximal element. Fix that. That is called, call it as H. Clearly, F contains inside H. So, our aim is to show that F does not cover X. So, we showed H does not cover X. In fact, what we will show is the following, namely the claim which says that the claim is even stronger than what we need, namely union of all members of H is actually contained inside union of all members of this epsilon. Okay, remember this epsilon comes from the subbase S, the subfamily of subbases. Okay, and we know that this doesn't cover. So, so this is what we have to prove. Okay, which is stronger than just showing that F does not cover. 
Okay, let us prove this one now. Take a member here, u inside h. By the very definition, u is a member of the base. Member of the base means it is the intersection of finitely many elements s1, s2, sn from the subbase s. We claim that one of the SIs is actually inside H. Okay. See, so started with some U inside B. Okay. We want to show that that U is concerned in the union of these things. Okay. So now what we end up is saying that one of these SI is actually inside H. Okay. If this is not the case, let us say it is not inside H. So this is another subclaim. You may say claim three, <laughs> but claim two is not yet done. Huh? It's part of claim two. So suppose one of these S1 and S2 SN is not inside H. If this is not the case, that means then consider the family HI, which is H union singleton I. Add this one more member. You get another family. Add H1, add S1, you get one family, H1. Add S2, you get H2. Add S3, you get S3, and so on. So you get H1, H2, H3s, which are all larger than H. If you have put one extra element, and that time assuming is not inside H. Each of them is a subfamily of B. Okay. So every element inside this curly S is inside B also and contains H, which of course contains F. But by maximality of H, these HI are not members of theta. You see, they are larger than, because each H, H is a maximal element. This can happen only if each of them, each of them admits a finite subcover. There are members in this family such that union of them is a finite cover for X. Okay. So what are those members? If you pick up only members for a match, that is not going to cover. So each time you have to put SI also. But just SI may not cover. Along with some members here, finitely many, this SI will cover. That is the meaning of that. Okay, so I get for each I, say ui1, ui2, ui, ui, pi, one less than k less than u2, up to pi, ui1, ui2, etc. These are the members of hi, union, actually they are members of h, union 1 si. All these ui k's are members of h. And what are they? They are the this union is whole of X. Okay. SI has to be there. If SI is not there, that will be give you H is a cover, finite cover. That, that is the assumption that H is H doesn't have a finite subcover. Now look at all these UI case from H1, H2, H3, and so on, along with. Instead of S1, S2, Sn, okay, you just take the intersection. Okay. And now the Kruskov's matter is that this will be a finite subcover for X. Clearly, it is finite. It is a finite subcover for X. But these are all members of H only now. These are members of H. You, you starting with a uh, member of H. Why this is the cover for X? Take any point. If they are inside UI case, any fix one PI or fix one I, if they are UI case, that is fine. Otherwise, they will be in the corresponding SI. Each time if they are here, that's okay. But if this is not here, none of, none of these UI case contain a point X then this point must be inside SI for every I, which is the same thing as saying that point is inside U. Therefore, this is a cover. 
okay so this violates the fact that h is belongs to theta because it is a finite sum cover so what we have proved is a substatement here that one of the SIs, let us call it as S1, is already in H. Okay. So that just means that this S1 is an element of this epsilon, right? See, S1 is already inside H. S1, where we started with S1, S2, and S10. Okay. They are intersections of uh, just intersections of, sorry, yeah, this each SIs are members of curly S. Okay. This, this is the base, this is the basic elements here. All right. But what is epsilon? Epsilon is H intersection S. Right. If it is in H also, and a, instead of sub basic, instead of basic, if it's a sub basic open set, that will be inside epsilon by definition. Therefore, U is inside S1, which just means that U is contained in the union of all these. This is the second part that we wanted to show. The RHS here. RHS here one of the members contains you because that element is inside epsilon okay so u is one of them so started with this one so we have shown that this union is contained inside that one so that completes the proof of the claim to and therefore Alexander subbase is proved. Therefore, we have completed the proof of Tikhonov's theorem also. Okay. One question that immediately occurs to our mind is what happens to the analog of Alexander subbase theorem for Lindelof property? Remember, we have already seen that Lindelof is not even finite productive. Namely, we have seen that the, the L, R, L, where L is the semi interval topology, has the property that the product is not Lindelof, whereas RL itself is Lindelof. Okay. But Alexander subbase theorem may still be true. Why? Why that is not true? Why, what is happening? Is it not true at all? So this is what we want to question. Does the imitation of the proof in the case of compactness work if we simply try to replace the phrase finite subcover by countable subcover? Wherever finite, you know, that doesn't admit finite at all. It's not a countable, countable. If you want, why, why, where do we go wrong? You can figure out where it is, but here is a concrete example which says that even you know, Alexander Subway's theorem, you know, the statement will not be true if you recover, if you replace the you know, compactness by Lindelof property. Okay. So, that makes the Alexander subbases more important in some way. <laughs> See, it's just such a narrow thing and still he, he was able to prove such a thing. That is the whole idea. Okay. So, for this one, I will just quote this XI 3.0 91.2 okay but let me give you a little bit of this one what is it look at the family s of closed intervals a comma b where a is strictly less than b okay 
then S forms a subbase for a topology on R. Any family of subsets of a subsets of a given given set X will form a topology as a subbase. Okay, but this topology is nothing but discrete topology. Okay, this topology is a discrete topology. Why? Because given any x, I can take something x minus 1 to x and other one x to x plus 1, both closed intervals. Intersection will be just singleton x. So every singleton x is open mean it's a discrete space. On the other hand, so once it is a discrete space, by the way, an uncountable discrete space is not Lindelof. Okay. On the other hand, the exercise there asserts that every cover by a subfamily of S, this, this is S, admits a countable subcover. This is for the usual topology of R. Okay. With the usual topology of R, you show that take A and B a close, use the topology of R. That is a finite subcover. You just show. The finite subcover part is just set theory. So it covers R. Even this may be infinite, uh, sorry, this is not finite subcover, countable subcover. This may be uncountable cover normally, but you can have a countable subcover. So this was the exercise. The point is, if you take open intervals AB, then of course you know that it is because R is Lindelof. You have to use that also. But now you have to show that even if you cover it by closed intervals, it will have a countable subcover. Okay. So, granting that exercise, what we have is the following namely, Alexander subbase theorem is not true for Lindelof's property. There is another remark which I would like to do, <clears throat> not with Alexander subbase theorem or quotient theorem and so on, but another property for whether something is a uh, productive, namely quotient maps. Take two quotient maps and take the product of these maps. So x1 to y1, x2 to y2, then you have a product map from x1 cross x2 to y1 cross y2. Okay. More generally, you can ask for families xi to yi or qi is a quotient map. Then you can take the product map here from product of xi to product of y1. Is it a quotient map? And then you can study the properties, okay, quotient, straightforward quotient may fail, but suppose you take open maps, suppose you take open quotient maps or closed maps or closed quotient maps and so on. So there are a number of such problems. So I just sum it up, we will not go to deeper study of these things, they are not uh, too difficult or uh, they are easy or too difficult <laughs> in fact. So some, some of them I will take it in the, in the part 2 of this course. But right now you can observe that openness is finite productive. If you take an open map, two open maps, product will be an open map that is very easy to see. Okay, and if you have open quotient, means open and surjective map, that is an open quotient, then it will be productive, no restrictions, even you can take arbitrary products. Okay, if 3 and 4 are much harder, just if you take arbitrary quotients, just quotient map, even two of them will not be quotient. Uh, will not be 
a quotient map need not be quotient map okay unless you assume some more hypothesis okay so that is an interesting case here which is needed in many other places also so but that will be done in part 2 so we will stop here with uh, productive properties and so on whatever so far properties which we have studied so next time we shall start studying some more topological properties they will be in general they will be called as what what is the name largeness properties thank you